Hi, everyone. It's now 2 p.m. Eastern time. You have joined the webinar for Improving Police and Mental Health Partnerships for Youth in Crisis. To allow for additional sign-ins past the hour, we will be starting in two minutes. Thanks for joining. Hello, thank you for joining today's webinar on improving police and mental health partnerships for youth in crisis. My name is Felicia Lopez Wright and I'm a project manager at the Council of State Governments Justice Center. I will be facilitating today's webinar, um, which is hosted by the US Department of Justice Bureau of Justice Assistance or BJA. So to give you an overview of today's webinar, first we will do introductions of our speakers and provide a brief overview of BJA and the CSG Justice Center. Then we will learn about the Mobile Response and Stabilization Services Program as a model for establishing police and behavioral health partnerships for youth in crisis. Then we will hear from Atlantic, Atlantic City, New Jersey's police department and their experience with mobile response via New Jersey's system of care called Perform Care. We will also have time for questions and answers before wrapping up the webinar. Anytime during the webinar, you can ask a question by clicking on the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen and entering your question. This includes both technical and content related questions. We will try to reply to technical questions in the chat as we go. For the content related questions, we will keep a running list and address them at the end of the webinar. We will do our best to get through as many questions as possible. If you encounter technical or audio problems during the webinar, refer to the information that's posted in the chat. Please understand that there are some technical issues that we may not be able to resolve. Um, we are recording the webinar and we will post it along with the PowerPoint slides on our website within one to two, one to two weeks. Next slide, please. Um, here we have an overview of our speakers. Like I said, my name is Felicia Lopez Wright and I'm a project manager at the CSG Justice Center. And I'm joined by my colleague, Stephen Deal, who's a senior policy analyst within the Behavioral Health Division, also at CSG Justice Center. And we are joined by our uh, presenter, El Elizabeth Manley, Senior Advisor for Health and Behavioral Policy for the Innovations Institute at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work and Sergeant Brian Shapiro from the Atlantic City Police Department. Uh, Elizabeth Manley is nationally recognized for her expertise in children's behavioral health, intellectual developmental disability, and substance use systems design, policy, and financing. Elizabeth has a specific focus on innovation and evidence-based practice implementation with states and communities. Her 30 years of executive leadership at the national, state, and provider levels in both the public and private sectors have given her a unique understanding of the complexity of systems in these areas. Elizabeth is a senior advisor for the Innovations Institute at the University of Connecticut School of Social Work, and in this capacity, she's a thought partner for leaders in service systems design. Elizabeth is the former Assistant Commissioner for New Jersey's Children's System of Care. In this capacity, Ms. Manley led transformation and implementation of system innovations, including integrating individuals with developmental intellectual disabilities, substance use, and integration of physical health into the children's system of care. She had direct oversight of the statewide child behavioral health, substance use, and developmental intellectual disability systems. This includes a wide range of home and community-based services, outpatient and residential interventions. 
Elizabeth was the Department of Children and Families representative on the New Jersey Board of Social Work Examiners and the Governor's Council on Alcohol and Drug Abuse, the principal investigator on New Jersey's Promising Path to Success, which is a SAMHSA system of care expansion grant with the focus on improving care for youth in need of a residential intervention, and vice chair of the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. She's also presented at several national conferences. Sergeant Brian Shapiro began his law enforcement career in 2005 as a police officer in Atlantic City, New Jersey with the Atlantic City Police Department. He graduated from the police academy and was assigned to a foot patrol initiative in residential portions of Atlantic City stricken with violent crime. Sergeant Shapiro has served in a wide variety of assignments ranging from uniform patrol, criminal investigations section, background investigations, professional standards, and the Office of Public Safety. He has also served in multiple command capacities for high profile, large scale events. He was promoted to Sergeant in 2016 and supervised special law enforcement officers in the tourism district unit. Currently, he is assigned to the office of the chief of police serving in the at risk initiative or ARI. The ARI is a community of interest established to collaboratively address the impact and needs of individuals who suffer from homelessness, untreated active addiction disorders and mental illness. The ARI partnerships recognize the need for communication and the value of working cooperatively for better outcomes for the community and at-risk individuals. Ideal ARI efforts focus on connecting those in need to social services. The ARI workflow on framework is a three-pronged approach of engagement, education, and enforcement with empathy being foundational across the board. Um, next slide, please. We can talk about BJA. <laughs> so BJA's mission is to provide leadership and services in grant administration and criminal justice policy development to support state, local, and tribal justice strategies to achieve safer communities. BJA works with communities, governments, and nonprofit organizations to reduce crime, recidivism, and unnecessary confinement and promote a safe and fair criminal justice system. And the Council of State Governments Justice Center is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization that combines the power of a membership association representing state officials in all three branches of government with the expertise of a policy and research team focused on assisting others to attain measurable results. Our staff develops research driven strategies to increase public safety and to strengthen communities. And this slide just describes a bit more about our work style and how we strive to reflect the Justice Center core values which include a commitment to being independent and nonpartisan in every aspect of our work, providing rigorous, trusted, high quality analysis, developing practical and innovative solutions informed by data and research, promoting collaboration and building consensus, and being inclusive and respectful of diverse views and experiences. And these are our, um, our goals. The overarching goals that guide our work here are to break the cycle of incarceration, advance health opportunity and equity, and use data to improve safety and justice. And here's our equity and inclusion statement. The CSG Justice Center is committed to advancing racial equity internally and through our work with states, local communities, and tribal nations. We support efforts to dismantle racial inequities within the criminal and juvenile justice systems by providing rigorous and high quality research and analysis to decision makers and helping stakeholders navigate the critical and at times uncomfortable issues the data reveal. We rely on stakeholder engagement and other measures to advance equity, provide guidance and technical assistance, and improve outcomes across, across all touch points in the justice, behavioral health, crisis response, and reentry systems. And through the Justice and Mental Health Collaboration Program, or JMHCP, BJA aims to help states, local government, and federally recognized Indian tribes improve responses to and outcomes for people with mental health conditions or co-occurring mental health conditions and substance use disorders who come into contact with the criminal justice system and support public safety by facilitating collaboration among the criminal justice, juvenile justice, and mental health and substance use disorder treatment systems. So again, uh, welcome to everyone joining us today and special thank you to our speakers. So happy to have you here uh, presenting on this important topic. Um, so I'm going to transition now to Ms. Elizabeth Manley who will teach us all about the mobile response and stabilization services program for youth. Thank you and thank you for having me today. It's truly a privilege to join you and um, what I think is an incredibly important conversation about the unique needs of children and youth 
families when it comes to young people who are experiencing some uh, oh, behavioral Elizabeth, we're not able to hear you. Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. Sorry. <laughs> sorry, no problem. Just uh, just wanted to thank folks for, for uh, having me today. It's really a privilege to be here. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about mobile response and stabilization. It is really thinking about customizing a crisis continuum for children, youth, uh, young adults, and their families. And we recognize that in a crisis system, the needs of adults are different than the needs of children. And with that, mobile response and stabilization is a specific way of actually engaging young people and their families in a way that's important. The first part of that uh, conversation, I think, is um, in understanding um, the partnership between local mobile response and stabilization teams and law enforcement uh, as partners within this work. And I will tell you right up front that mobile response and stabilization is not a co-responder model where law enforcement and mobile response teams go together. It is rather the, the children's behavioral health system stepping in and saying that we can actually make sure that these children, youth, and families are safe. That um, the role of uh, mobile response and stabilization is to allow um, the behavioral health system really to get there quicker. Um, and by quicker, I mean uh, when parents, caregivers, and, and young people themselves begin to see that something is changing and something is happening. And at the request of families, we respond uh, to those uh, situations in a way that is meaningful. So it leads to better health outcomes uh, for young people and families. And today we'll talk about a couple of state examples. As you heard in my uh, bio that I'm the former assistant commissioner for New Jersey's Children's System of Care. And I'm uh, really excited that Sergeant Shapiro is going to tell a story. I should tell you right up front, I have never met Sergeant Shapiro. So uh, I'm really interested in his feedback on how things are going on the ground. Um, but the role of mobile response and stabilization is to really be a, um, a, a, a way of helping law enforcement um, be able not to be the first responders when it comes to children and have actual real solutions for families that, that law enforcement come across on a daily basis. So it's an important part of the work uh, for all of us is to really be partners in this. Uh, recognizing that uh, mobile response teams and law enforcement don't have all the answers, but in coordination, we actually can come together in a way that makes sense uh, for children and their families. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, that'd be helpful. So the first part of this conversation starts with trauma. And, and a lot of folks often ask me, why do we start with trauma? I, we start with trauma because uh, uh, for many young people who begin to experience uh, shifts in their behavior, trauma is a core component of that. Um, not all, but some. And because of that, systems tend to overlap trauma on top of trauma. And because there's this trauma experience, now examples of that could be law enforcement responding uh, to a young person who has had a very traumatic experience or the child welfare system stepping in um, and doing what it needs to do in order to keep children safe sometimes has this impact of, of, of traumatic experience. So we talk about trauma um, from the impact of both that child's experience, could be um, you know, the intergenerational uh, traumatic experience for families. So we really come to this crisis work from a place in which we understand that many of the individuals that we are uh, responding to um, have really had a trauma experience. And because of that, we start generally with this quote, and that is that what works best is anything that increases the quality and number of relationships in a child's life. It's the people, not the programs that change people. And that's according to Dr. Bruce Perry, one of the preeminent uh, trauma folks uh, in this country these days. He has a new book out called um, uh, what Happened to You? It's a terrific book that he co-wrote with Oprah Winfrey, if folks are interested. Um, but it's also uh, important to know that new, the newest research tells us that, um, that trauma can be healed within the context of individuals' homes, that it doesn't require us to take uh, individuals to, in, to hospitals or emergency departments. And what we know from children and uh, from young people across this country, who I've had the privilege of speaking to many of them across the country, is that a visit to the emergency department can be a very trauma uh, uh, experience for uh, young people. 
some of which never really recover from those experiences. And so it's really important that we get these pieces of the work right when it comes to children. Um, it also tells us that, uh, the new research tells us that, um, that those trauma, creating trauma-informed healing environments within the home are the precursor to the real uh, work that happens later uh, for young people who have experienced trauma. And what that means is that uh, for young people, there is a difference between a crisis system addressing and calming the situation in the short term and then formal interventions. Young people at the time that the crisis system generally touches in their lives are not ready for formal systems like outpatient care, intensive outpatient care, even residential or inpatient care become more problematic for young people than helpful. And so part of the goal in, in a service in, like mobile response and stabilization is to set the stage to help the adults in the child's life understand what's happening, be able to connect dots around what is possible to get that child immediately back into school with the supports that are, are necessary to keep that young person moving forward and to help build a safety plan for that young person to be able to be able to be safe in school, be in their safe in their own homes, in their own environments. Really important pieces of the work of mobile response and stabilization. Next slide. So let me just give you a little history on mobile. Mobile response and stabilization is a service that's been in New Jersey as an example for well over 20 years. It was originally part of the systems transformation in New Jersey's uh, behavioral health system. It has been in Connecticut for well close to 20 years, I believe at this point. Um, and it's been uh, a, one of the core components of Oklahoma's um, trans transformation in their uh, crisis delivery system. It is also an ongoing national conversation around how do we customize specifically for children now that 988 is up and moving in many states. What I wanna say just real quickly around 988 is that it's a really helpful tool and people like me are very, very excited about what the potential for 988 is. The challenge in 988 at this particular time is that in, in 988, um, the goal is to de-escalate folks over the phone at 80% of the time. And one of the feedback that we hear from families on a regular basis is that because of what's happening with their own child, they're experiencing this escalation at the same time that their child is. And that de-escalation over the phone is really frustrating for many families. They believe that they need someone to actually hold their hand to help them really understand what it is that's going on for their child. So in the mobile response and stabilization world, we're looking at a, a, an actual response in the community, in the child's home, in their school, in their community, with the parent and the child at the same time. So there's a couple of really important components. And, and you can see here that we made the case uh, for um, a children's crisis continuum to the National Association of State Mental Health Program Directors. This is a paper that is available. Mobile response and stabilization is a core component of a, a full continuum of care for children because it meets the needs of children, youth, and young adults and their parents and caregivers. And it recognizes that this is an interconnected relationship in which we really need to make sure that we're supporting both the young person and their families. That de-escalation and the amelioration of a crisis before restrictive and costly interventions becomes necessary. And this is important, not just in the short term, but in the long term. And that ensures this connection to necessary services and supports, including the return of the young person to school, including uh, the engagement of the parent caregiver and the other support systems for these young, young people. And the key services that shift from overuse of high-end services and supports um, to home and community-based services is really important within this conversation around mobile response and stabilization. Next slide, please. So its goal is to maintain young people in their own home, in their own living situation. And this includes children in foster care, um, where you know, it is not uncommon for a young person who touches within a foster care system to move from one foster home to another or to experience a crisis situation in which they end up in emergency departments or inpatient care. What we know from good implementation around mobile response and stabilization is that when we have a team that understands the traumatic event that a, 
a young person might have experienced. As an example, if a young person touches in foster care, the removal from their home itself can be a traumatic experience. That traumatic experience is when the system begins to traumatize young people and adults become less and less trustworthy. When we put mobile response and stabilization in place and help support young people who've made that transition into a foster home, we support both that foster parent as well as um, that young person in understanding how trauma impacts on, the, on their bodies, in their, in their lives, and what can happen to support that young person in a way that is nurturing and helpful. Um, the goal for mobile response and stabilization is to keep all children in homes. And New Jersey's data is 99% of the time when mobile response and stabilization um, goes to the home, that child stays in their bed, then there are other moves that might happen, including going to, um, you know, going to another relatives and all kinds of other things. But 99% of the time, the child sleeps in the bed that they were slept in the night before. That's pretty important data in this conversation. Uh, Connecticut has similar data and Oklahoma is moving in that direction. So we can see that the work of mobile really changes the dynamics around the overutilization of emergency departments and inpatient care for young people who may not be ready for those interventions and those can be traumatizing to them. That mobile supports youth and families providing trauma-informed care. But teams really need to be very well versed in trauma and what it means and setting up the environment within that uh, where that child lives to understand what trauma experiences young people might have experienced and how to ensure that systems don't compound that trauma uh, by, their, by the interventions themselves. And we promote and support safe behavior in the home, schools, and communities, reduce the use of emergency departments, hospitals, um, and eventually, by the way, the use of detention centers uh, due to behavioral health crisis and the use of things like residential ultimately. And we assist youth and families in accessing and linking to ongoing services, supports, um, intensive clinical might be necessary and uh, to, the, to the higher intensities of services for young people who might have a more complex behavioral health need. Next slide, please. So let's talk about customization, right? Um, what does that mean? Like, why are we talking about mobile response and stabilization in a way that looks different? Because some of this might sound really familiar uh, to folks who are familiar with a, a crisis system that does in-home, goes to see the family. What looks different? The first thing that's really different in mobile response and stabilization is the role that families and uh, that family plays right from the start. So parents are caregivers and youth have the most influence in mobile response and stabilization and all aspects of the service delivery system. And what that means is that when parents ask for help, we just go. We don't go back and say, oh, that's not really a big crisis, or I'm gonna to try to talk you down over the phone. When parents call, ask for help, we send it. Because when a parent gets to a place in which they call a public system and request assistance, it means that they need assistance. And we need to actually understand that that is part of the definition. One of the crisis behaviors that we see from parents and caregivers is on when they're in the crisis cycle, right? Their child might be in the crisis cycle. And when that happens, what we see is that uh, if we don't hear parents at that time, that they are more likely to use emergency departments, emergency uh, rooms, they, they're more likely to call for law enforcement assistance when it comes to their children. But when the service delivery system is organized to respond when a parent calls and asks for help, then that is less likely that those uh, more intensive services are used. That components and practices for youth and their families remain even when, in, um, when embedded in life uh, span um, response systems. In other words, what we're saying is that the crisis system uh, really should be designed more like the children's system, just in general, that it is really helpful uh, to have uh, a crisis system in which when people call and ask for help that we send it, uh, that that is our first response, and that the, that the backup response is to say, we can help you over the phone, sort of reverse what currently happens. In the current system, in adult system, we try to talk people down over the phone. In the mobile response and stabilization world, our first response is, we hear you, we're gonna come. 
we're going to come and we're going to help you. We're going to hold your hand and make sure that we get you through this experience. It includes identification of, of youth and families' needs and strengths, risk factors, cultural considerations, um, and preferences, right? So it's really important that this is an individualized way of engaging both young people and their families. So we can begin at the beginning part, the first time families have picked up the phone and called and asked for assistance, we want that experience to be the most positive experience that they've had. Because if that is true, then they will use the system and come to learn how to get help when they need it for the time and the duration that is necessary. And what happens in those situations is that we begin to see families um, actually use behavioral health services in a way that is meaningful and helpful, not just in the short term, but over the course of the lifetime. And what's also important about this conversation is that the work in places like New Jersey and Connecticut have allowed us to see outcomes, not just in the short term, but over time, because mobile response and stabilization has been available for such a long period of time. We'll talk about that in a second. By the way, if you have any questions, uh, you can pop them in the Q&A, that'd be great. Um, we're happy to take, and I'm happy to take any questions you might have. Next slide, please. So customization for children, youth, and uh, young adults, um, make sure that we have uh, teams that really are trained specifically to work with young people, uh, with children, youth, and families, right? So there's real skill level that's important in engaging 10-year-olds. When I was the uh, assistant commissioner for New Jersey's children's system of care, I talked with some folks who worked in emergency departments. And they told us basically uh, that they really weren't qualified to work with 10 year olds in emergency departments, that they were used to working with adults. The majority of people that they would see uh, on a regular basis were adults, that they didn't have the tools that they needed in their tool belt in order to address the needs of children. And we provided some training for those folks, but our real goal was to keep young people out of those emergency departments in the first place, recognize that we're trying to minimize the, any trauma exposure that young people might experience. So we wanna make sure that the teams that go really know how to work with 10 year olds and how to work with five year olds and how to work with 18 and 20 year olds. Um, so there's a lot of training support and certification processes that are in place within the world of mobile response and stabilization to ensure that young people get what they need at the time they need it for the duration. That it provides routine outreach and educational act activities um, to the community and to system partners. And this is a huge piece of the work. So in other words, what mobile response and stabilization uh, teams do is they, they go and they talk to law enforcement partners. They talk to schools. They, um, in New Jersey, as an example, there are education partnerships that meet on a regular basis. In places like Oklahoma, there's ongoing training and support to law enforcement. There is because of the, um, the way Oklahoma is um, a large state, it has got both a lot of rural areas as well as some frontier communities. Um, Oklahoma has used a strategy to engage law enforcement by equipping all law enforcement with iPads to be able to communicate immediately, for, in, for families to communicate immediately with mental health professionals while they're right on the scene. It's been a really smart strategy that has really helped law enforcement be able to engage youth and families in a way that is really meaningful. So there are a lot of different strategies that mobile response and stabilization teams use to engage our partners on the ground. So folks who are listening uh, who don't have mobile in your current community or you do have mobile in your current community, um, and I would love to hear from you around this. So later I'll give you my email address and please outreach and let me know uh, what's happening for all of you. But um, what happens is when these partnerships happen, innovation happens. We figure out how to solve the challenges that our partners have in engagement and making sure that, um, that everyone has the right tools around their belt in order to meet the real unique needs of children, youth, and families. What we don't want to see is four-year-olds um, really in emergency departments, and we don't want to see six-year-olds with handcuffs on. Um, and yet we know that that happens in, in parts of the country um, because uh, nobody on the ground has the right tools around their tool belt in order to get that job done right for children, youth, and families. And so the goal here is to understand how powerful and impactful mobile response is as a, as a clear tool in the tool belt when it comes to, um, to everyone 
who is engaged with children, youth, and family. Um, another part of this is that there's a priority safety and de-escalation in the community settings with connections uh, to natural support. So let me just give you an example of what that means. The teams are really well trained, not just in the safety and de-escalation of the crisis situation we're doing in homes, but actually how to manage through those communities um, to get safely from where they are into the homes of the children, youth, and families. So this is a really important comment, uh, a, a component of the work that happens. In other words, uh, teams go, they just go, they have to figure out how they're going to get there and what it's going to look like. And a lot of the, the time that mobile response teams spend in the preparation is learning the ins and outs of all parts of their community. A lot of upfront work with law enforcement is important and helpful in understanding the parts of the community uh, that we need to navigate, what it looks like and how uh, we're going to nav navigate those roads safely. So that's all part of that work that's so important right up front. Next slide, please. So mobile response and stabilization is really grounded in what we call systems of care. And it's a values driven, um, uh, it's about values and principles and how we decision make. And so it is, um, in, in being grounded in systems of care, it requires us to, to know that we're going to individualize care. We're going to prioritize uh, our parents, our caregivers, our young people's voices in a way that is incredibly meaningful. But we're also going to have real partners in every community in which we serve. That includes schools, pediatricians, it includes YMCAs, but it really also includes law enforcement in a way that is really meaningful in terms of these conversations. Um, that mobile response and stabilization is a rapid response. That means we go, you just go. When there is a, a situation where a parent calls, teams respond within an hour anywhere within the communities that they serve. That is the goal for us in terms of building mobile response and stabilization across the country. It does not exist in every community these days, but it is our goal for it to exist across the country in every single community because we know what the impact has been. The mobile response and stabilization is vetted within a full spectrum of effective services and supports for youth who are at risk of behavioral health and emotional challenges. That means that we wanna make sure that not only can we respond to the immediate uh, situation that's happening, but we can connect to eight weeks of stabilization services that are available for families within the home schools and communities and for young people who have real complexity that we can um, connect to uh, intensive care coordination for a longer period of time. All of those things are essential in part of this uh, really important conversation. Next slide, please. Mobile response and stabilization is designed to work with young people and families and youth. Um, it, and really, it is about working not just with those young people and their families, but to work with the service delivery system. So child welfare and juvenile justice partners to touch with young people who might, have might be at risk of going to detention, to talk with uh, pediatricians who are working with young people with intellectual or developmental disabilities. It is all of it. Every young person is, um, this is a response that should be available for every young person as a public health approach within any state's service room. That is, there's engagement with uh, informal supports as well, because we know that about 70% of all uh, good outcomes for young people, there's a, this informal component of, of the work that's so important, like connection to things like, uh, to jobs and to uh, YMCAs, to, um, to yoga and to other informal supports that really help us ma manage the traumatic and stress, overwhelm stress systems that young people have that we have to see before the crisis gets to the point where more um, intensive intervention is necessary. This is why that upstream piece is so important. And so let me put it grounded and put it in perspective for you. If when a parent or caregiver picks up the phone, calls and asks for help, and we go, we know that they're in the early part of the crisis system. That means that a parent might call and say, hey, by the way, you know, my 15 year old won't get off the sofa and I don't know what to do about it. Um, it also might mean that they call and say, my six-year-old will need a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, and I don't know what to do about it. 
Now, to many folks, that might mean, might look like there's a parenting issue and a parenting problem. And from my perspective, I could tell you that I used to think that as well. But what we know is that the activity of lifting the phone, calling and ask for help means the parent is already escalated within the crisis system. And chances are there's been significant uh, in escalation for young people and their families. It is important to know and understand that when uh, teams go, that there, that there is an actual crisis situation that's happening that without intervention will only escalate further. That these are the families that we don't go, we find later in systems have ended up in emergency departments, inpatient care, out of risk, out of state residential care. Um, and many have ended up ultimately in the child welfare system as parents have a real challenge in how it is that they're gonna manage those behavioral health needs. So we want to intercede before the crisis gets to that place. Next slide, please. The thing about it is we meet urgency with urgency, right? So the crisis is defined by the parent or the caregiver. We want parents to tell us what's happening. That requests are not screened in based on that perceived acuity, right? We just go. And because we just go, we're going to find out what is happening. Talk to mobile teams all over the country. None of them would tell you that they go to uh, to a situation where a parent is called and asked for help without uh, that situation being escalated. That requests for help are attended to rapidly and consistently, that we use public health approach, that means all children, regardless of their ability to pay, um, are eligible, that it's 24-7, 365 face-to-face -face, uh, response. And I just want to uh, say that there's generally a single point of access one phone number to call. So as an example, you'll hear later about Perform Care. Perform Care in New Jersey is the single point of access for the children's behavioral health system, the intellectual and developmental disability system, and for the substance use system in New Jersey. So what that means is you can pick up the phone, call that 1877 number, ask for help, and then Perform Care will help figure out what that help is going to do. So it could be a team that's gonna come and they'll be there within an hour. Any parent caregiver who calls and asks for help, that's exactly what happens. Next slide, please. The mobile response is face-to-face -face within an hour anywhere. That young adult or family defines the crisis, that there's crisis de-escalation, and that there's an assessment, a child-specific assessment that tells us what's going on with that young person so that we can figure out what are the best interventions in order to meet the unique needs of children and young parents. Next slide, please. Stabilization is different. So mobile response has two components. It has a, a quick response, urgent response, get there within an hour, work with a young person and family for up to 72 hours, because that's part of the crisis cycle as we know it. There's escalation, de-escalation, escalation, de-escalation that happens within that 72 hour period. So those teams can be in for as long as they need to be in order to de-escalate that situation for that 72 hour component. For young people who need more, there is the ability to actually provide support and continuity of care for young people in their own homes um, for up to eight weeks. And that includes both clinical, clinical care in the home, but it also includes the connection to schools, the, the actual finding of informal support. So it's this combination of two things that are really important. For many young people, um, they need both of these components, not just one. One isn't quite enough. And if in states that are up, you know, building mobile, oh, we see that there's this um, uh, cycling of that, of that 72 hour period. Um, and that happens over and, over and over again because stabilization services are not quite available as of yet. All states that are working in this area are trying to work on building these two components so that they connect to each other in a way that is meaningful. So stabilizations are provided in the home and the community. We keep children in their own homes. Uh, the second you remove a child from their home, life becomes much more complicated on trying to get them back into their home. That there's a connection to community supports and services. That there's a reconnection with activities such as sports and uh, you know, all kinds of other activities that young people participate in that there's in-home clinical support is necessary in a connection to the higher level support if necessary. So what that means is that we're gonna connect the dots to whatever children need uh, in order to meet those unique needs and help 
uh, young people to be able um, to heal from their behavioral health needs, uh, learn how to use the behavioral health system in a way that is meaningful and uh, be able to um, uh, be, be able to stay within that developmental process. Uh, so they stay on track in school um, uh, and don't get off track, which is a really important component of this work. Next slide, please. So the partners within this work, right, are, um, uh, are really important for us to talk about, right? So, and I wanna just spend a minute talking about how these systems interconnect. So the systems collaboration and community uh, partnerships, let's start with child welfare, right? So in the world of child welfare, uh, children in child welfare should not have a separate behavioral health system. They have, should have one system that's organized in a way that's going to meet their needs. And so for a young person um, who touches on child welfare because there's a worry about abuse and neglect, we want to make sure that mobile response goes hand in hand with that child as they move through um, the, the system to ensure that their uh, behavioral health needs are met. In many states where uh, behavioral health, uh, mobile response exists, there is a connect between the child a uh, welfare hotline, child protection service hotline, and the single point of access for mobile so that families get diverted often uh, to mobile as the first uh, responders when there's some worry about the child's behavior rather than the parent abuse and neglect concern. So it's a really complicated issue, but it is important because these two things get interconnected all of the time. Then when we talk about our juvenile justice partners, and first of all, law enforcement plays a really important role of making sure that when you bump up against children who uh, youth and youth who aren't where they supp they're supposed to be and things are happening for them, that there's real complexity within a lot of families that gets, um, and you'll hear this from Sergeant Shapiro in just a little bit, that the concern is keeping young people out of the detention center. Uh, why do we wanna keep them out of the detention center? Um, because the outcomes for young people who touch on and get mobile rather than touch on, on the, uh, the ten detention center is just overwhelming when you look at the data in states like New Jersey that have been able to reduce the daily uh, use of um, uh, juvenile detention by 70%. Uh, they have reduced the use of um, probation by 70%. Um, some other really important data points, New Jersey closed a uh, um, a um, adult um, adult jail correctional facility. They were able to convert that into a substance use. I think they converted it into a substance use facility. So it's really important to know that there are other alternatives and the use of mobile response and stabilization is really helpful for families, not only in the short term, but in the long term in trying to figure out how this all works and connects together. For family courts, it's often uh, that, that um, uh, judges uh, can use mobile response and stabilization as a mechanism to, to keep children and young uh, and families safe in the community while they're trying to sort out whether or not there are other things that need to get taken care of. For education partners, mobile response and stabilization is this coordinating piece, right? We come together to work together when it comes to young people who are struggling. And when you work intensively with schools, you can help defer young people from touching in emergency departments, the using uh, law enforcement to intercede for young people within education is a really important uh, component. In other words, our goal with mobile response and stabilization to keep children in their chairs, in school, learning, growing, and being able to stay on their developmental path. The pediatricians and primary care uh, providers are a big part of this work because parents uh, turn both to schools and to uh, pediatricians uh, first to ask for advice and figure out what it is that's going on with their, ch their child. When we can effectively and efficiently engage folks in these conversations, really amazing things happen. And the same thing with law enforcement, right? So the goal here is around partnership um, and collaboration, being able to work together so you recognize that mobile response and stabilization have the expertise to engage young people and their families in a way that can keep them from moving, escalating further in crisis situations. It also helps us be able to figure out how we're going to manage 
the adult mental health needs of this young person has later, right? Let me just put that in perspective. 75% of all adult mental health challenges begin in children, 75%. So that's true. That first intervention, that first intervention for young people is incredibly impactful. It changes the whole trajectory for young people over the course of their life. And so when we get that piece right, it's really important um, for young people, not just in the day-to-day of what happens right now, but what happens for them later. The other thing that, that's important in this is that if we get it wrong, then our job is to mitigate against the next crisis and figure out how it is that we're going to figure out what happened, come back to the table, help young people know that we are still working in their best interest. That is another part of the system that we often train our mobile response and stabilization teams to be able to effectively impact when it comes to young people and bring in other parts of the service delivery system to do that. But it's important for us to do that. Then emergency departments are not a place for young people to be. Um, And what we know is that in states that mobile response and stabilization is not currently available, that there's been escalation and overuse in the use of emergency departments boarding in uh, hospitals. And so part of the work here is to keep young people from moving to emergency departments in the first place. If a young person needs inpatient care, that's a whole nother story. And there are some young young people who might need inpatient care. And when that happens, that there are ways to do that in a way that is non-traumatizing for young people. And that the community is part of the solution. Right. So how is the community part of the solution? The community is part of the solution by making sure that we are engaging community partners on a regular basis and making sure that the community is part of the solution. If young people can return to their schools, as example, and then after school participate in football or, you know, in the play or go to a yoga studio, if we can keep them moving in the direction of being employed, then things really turn around for young people who have experienced some really um, uh, big challenges and issues and concerns. And so these are really important components of all of that. Um, There's a a couple of questions. I'm just gonna take a couple of these questions right real quick because they kind of sort of fit into some of the questions. So there's a question about training certification requirements for providers of these youth and mobile response teams. Um, States who are building mobile response and stabilization as a core component of their service array are also building training and uh, certification requirements. So as an example, and I'll just use New Jersey, but also we could look to Connecticut, Oklahoma, Um, We all have certification processes that require uh, teams to be trained, supervised, uh, shadow, they do shadow work, they are supervised by clinicians. What is also important to know, though, and I just put this out there, is that for the best practice around mobile response and stabilization allows us to use bachelor's prepared individuals um, and peer support partners, that's parents generally, Uh, parents peer support partners. So a parent talking to a parent about their experience goes a long way. We're building for the first time youth peer support. So that means individuals who are over the age of 18, because it's a little complicated when they're younger, um, over the age of 18 um, can uh, in some states be, be certified to actually be part of those mobile response teams. We'll see how that goes. It's early in its um, in its development, but there's a lot of promise uh, because young people respond incredibly well to young people. So that's a, um, a really important part of this. And we can certainly guide and direct you to the places in which the certification uh, conversation is happening. Um, also, is there a standard assessment tool that mobile teams use to evaluate the needs? Yes, there is um, generally, right? So our... our um, Uh, Part of best practice is that there uh, is a particular tool that's used that is, um, uh, many states, I'll just say this, use a version of the child and adolescent needs and strength tool called the CAT, the crisis assessment tool. That's what New Jersey does. A couple other states do. Um, There are a couple of other assessment tools that are used. The key to success is it should be an assessment tool that's specifically designed uh, for children and families takes into consideration the whole picture of what's happening for young people and um, is uh, 
a tool that you're using across. So we don't want providers uh, using a separate, their own tool. We want all, um, all of the system to use the same tools. And part of the reason we want them to use the same tools is that it makes for better communication. They can actually communicate more efficiently, effectively. We can also see, um, uh, we can compare apples to apples and making sure that the interventions make sense uh, for each of those young people. So it's really important that we do that. Um, and then um, the, the next question is, uh, I'm curious about the engagement of mobile response and stabilization when families start engaging with the child welfare system. Yeah, that's curious. Uh, is there a referral process to alert mobile response teams about families or families in foster given specific education? It's a fabulous question. And let me just say that this is relatively new in the world of mobile. New Jersey was the first state to, to put this in place um, and it is in policy. And so what happens is um, for children who are moving to foster, it's part of the upfront conversation that has to happen with the parent. And that team actually can go, if the child stays one night in foster, they can go with a biological family or with kinship. And that does happen. So it's pretty uh, remarkable when that, when that happens. However, um, the, the goal with the interaction with child welfare isn't just specifically for young people who touch in foster. In other words, families learn about mobile right up front um, from the child welfare system, but they also learn about it from uh, their education partners, from the schools. They're learning about it from pediatricians, and you'll hear uh, uh, from uh, from law enforcement in New Jersey how they they work when use it as well. So, uh, well, I take one more question in here, um, and then I, I want to make sure that we get through all the slides. So the next question, do parents of neurodiverse children experience behavior crisis contact mobile response teams to help stabilize? Uh, so this is such a fabulous question. And the reason it's a fabulous question for me is because in 2012, when I became the assistant commissioner for New Jersey's Children's System of Care, I was immediately tasked with integration of young people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, so I was responsible for both of those service delivery systems. And what we learned very early, uh, and our performed care partners really were very helpful in this work, is um, that parents of children with intellectual and developmental disabilities did not use the mobile response and stabilization system initially because they thought it was connected to the Department of Children and Families, and they did not want to touch on child welfare. So there was a real fear about loss of their child. And um, this is why New Jersey's system really, uh, as you'll hear, perform care is the de facto system because it's, uh, for families, it's not immediately connected to the, part, uh, to the Department of Children and Families, but it is the Department of Children and Families who oversees every single component of that system. But what happened is engagement with those families uh, changed everything. So, you know, the on, on the ground work, talking to parents, caregivers, talking to advocates, allowed us to, to let families know that, that mobile could be really helpful. But the key to success is that mobile teams are very well trained in how to engage children who don't communicate um, you know, verbally, that use tools, they're familiar with all the communication tools that young people might use. They bring things like PEC boards with them uh, to those, um, um, you know, to those calls. So it, it, it is the de facto crisis system now for children with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And the feedback from parents was that it is a lifesaver for them. So it's really important. It was a great question. Thank you for asking that. Okay, um, I just wanna um, make sure I hit on, I think I, I might have one more slide, but I'm not positive. You wanna, there we go, yes. So I wanna just talk about how systems, because I'm a systems person, are required to talk to each other in the world of mobile response and stabilization. So it's not just this independent service that someone gets a contract for and just delivers it. It is about the behavioral health system, the child welfare system, the juvenile justice system, school systems, intellectual and developmental disability systems, emergency departments, law enforcement, everyone coming together and talking to each other locally all the time. And what that means is we have create tables in which people come together and be able to share challenges and opportunities, barriers, things that didn't work in a way they don't work. And as an example, in order to get to the place in which um, you'll hear a little bit more about today on um, perform care, 
we had to actually make sure that people knew if you didn't like perform care, it's because we didn't do our job well. So we need to know what you didn't like. So if it doesn't happen the way that I say that it happens, then you need to be able to communicate that with me in a way that I can fix it. And I, I'm going to fix it. That's the goal. We're going to fix whatever doesn't work. So these concrete collaborative agreements allow us to communicate and to innovate because not only do we want to fix what we knew uh, it was supposed to look like, we want to learn from our ongoing work together, how it works better. And you'll hear, I think, how the system continues to, um, to, to grow and innovate because of these local partnerships of where people come together and talk about uh, challenges, uh, barriers, opportunities, and what, what could have went better, what would have looked like if it went better. And by the way, families have a big role in that, in talking about their own experiences, uh, what worked, what didn't, providing feedback. Uh, you know, most of the feedback for, for folks like me is in the negative of how it didn't work. But every once in a while, I would get uh, emails or letters from folks in which it didn't work well. And so both of those things are really helpful in understanding, you know, what worked well, why did it work well, and how do we do more of that, and why didn't it work well, and how do we do less of that, right? So those are the really important components uh, in this work. Uh, so my, my point to this is, if you're in a state and a community in which they're building um, mobile, right, for children, be a partner to that. Be, be a really good partner to that uh, because those partnerships are really uh, important in the long run. And uh, my, my friend, Shamika Williams from Oklahoma, who did a lot of work in coordinating care for young people there, uh, would often talk about how these experiences, these conversations and these partnerships were just invaluable in making it work. And the willingness and openness of, of um, folks on the ground, uh, in particular law enforcement, to be really good partners in the work um, made all the difference in the world for every single one of those children that now get what I think is a really valuable intervention. Next slide, please. So just real quick, this mobile response and stabilization is truly about inter interruption points, as I've talked about, right? And what it means is that there are just these places in which we can play a mega role in changing the outcome for children, youth, and families. And I just want to say again, everyone can help with that. Everyone can help. Paying attention to young people that you know, you hear about, you know, um, you bump into. Changing the trajectory that doesn't have a child in foster care go to another foster home because of their behavior is huge. Changing the trajectory for a child who touches on an emergency department is huge. And by the way, never putting handcuffs on a six-year-old is just really important. Um, you know, there are ways for us to intervene with these young people in a way that is transformational for them and for the adults around them. So be a partner in that work could uh, make all the difference in the world. Next slide. Um, so, we also do this quality insurance work, right? So, uh, and what that means is uh, that we're working across systems to track outcomes. How do I know New Jersey is successful? Because we have zero children with behavioral health needs in out-of-state residential care, because there's a reduction in uh, the use of detention, but because they closed the, the children's state hospital, because emergency departments are not overwhelmed with children. Those are some of the quality insurance assurance pieces and tracking the outcomes. What we know is in the states that do that, including Connecticut and Oklahoma, you hear me talk a lot about them because they really are best practice states right now. Ohio is coming along doing really interesting creative work. And there, uh, there are a few other states that are doing really important work. So um, really making sure that we're paying attention to all these outcomes. The difference between adults and children, just real quick, is that um, in the adult world, we look at these um, success within this very short window. For children, uh, we know that we're successful because we see what happens that for them over longer and longer periods of time. Next slide, please. Okay, so that's my presentation. I really hope that I answered all of your questions and uh, it's been a, a real privilege to be with you today.
Thank you so much, Elizabeth. That was amazing. <laughs> um, we will now transition over to Sergeant Shapiro uh, from Atlanta City Police Department to um, just describe a bit about his experiences and his agency's experiences with using Perform Care, who uses that mobile response uh, model. So I'll, I'll pass it over to you, uh, Sergeant Shapiro. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity for being here today. Um, it's really a pre pleasure because this is such an important topic. And uh, following an act a presentation like I just uh, got to experience for my own self, uh, I took a lot away from that presentation. And in policing, I've been in, I've been in police work for approximately 18 plus years. And I found as a rookie uh, when I was first coming out of the police academy that uh, I, I suddenly realized what kryptonite looked like to parents, like what, you know, true tragedy on the face of a parent or a family member or guardian inside their house. When I came in as a law enforcement officer showing up to a scene, I saw individuals that were suffering because their kids were in crisis, their kids, the children were not doing well. And as a young officer, I really didn't have a lot of experience with being able to understand what were the services needed. And uh, so fast forward, I got involved in crisis intervention teams and I became uh, one of the founding chairs in Atlantic County. And we discovered that there was services associated with being able to call a company perform care. So when we showed up to these houses, we started to change our path of, you know, taking uh, cues from the training associated with verbal uh, communication, de-escalation, uh, utilizing uh, resource education. And one of the resources, like I said, Perform Care, we realized that we could call a phone number, we could communicate with uh, the parents and call for them with them, as long as they wanted to buy into the program, explaining to them that there were services out there to be able to help them in their moment of need to uh, help stabilize a scene. And the best part was from a law enforcement standpoint, uh, their response time, shockingly, was a services now approach with less than an hour in certain cases. And in some, the worst case that I've ever experienced with response time, it's been under two hours. Now in Atlantic City, just to give you some perspective of how busy we are, um, our population is around 30,000. And then during the summer, it goes up to about four, three to four times that every single day is our daily population. So resources do not really drastically increase during our summer months. And we are increasing our calls for service and our volume, our emergency response needs. So as a supervisor, when I got promoted a few years ago, um, we started to really push our education for our mobile response and stabilization services. Uh, thanks to uh, Elizabeth and her team, really, really planting some seeds. And now we're bearing the uh, gifts to be able to truly help families uh, in their time of need during crisis. But I think perform care really for, for, for my agency and for our officers, and being in a uni unique position, being a CIT coordinator for my county, we're also hearing in the county that these services are being leveraged and utilized um, throughout the county. So there's an education piece, thanks to the state of New Jersey, thanks to Elizabeth and her team, um, building the mobile response communication to law enforcement uh, that is being utilized throughout my county and from what I'm hearing from other uh, CIT coordinators in New Jersey. This is a resource that is truly being leveraged. And the some of what Liz said from a law enforcement standpoint, I, I really didn't quite comprehend until I got uh, into a supervisory position. Um, the first intervention is critical. And sometimes that intervention, there's breadcrumbs. An intervention doesn't have to always be presented with a crisis. You can see certain things going on inside of a household where a child is present for a, um, let's just say there's an overdose in the household from a family member due to an opiate overdose. Then we have systems to be able to notify the educational system because New Jersey subscribes to handle with care. So whether we are doing a notification through perform care and we are consulting with the parents with perform care professionals over the phone um, to, to deal with situations such as a crisis, uh, or we are seeing little breadcrumbs for opportunities to make an intervention, which is so critical. And those interruption points are there. 
we can literally change a trajectory before the crisis through performed care is just being on the phone with us. And the other part for any other individuals that are attending this seminar, the, the, here's the critical piece that I found was so important about New Jersey's investment in performed care and mobile response uh, teams. The communication that I have received when I have personally called and spoken to other officers throughout the county with performed care is the communication that I am receiving as a law enforcement officer and my coworkers have received. It's very welcoming. It's law enforcement friendly. They're not uh, rude. They're, they understand that some of the questions that we're going to ask or potentially help with the parents with, we're going to have to pause for a moment and say, hey, can you spell that? What would what'd you say again? What's this information? The call takers are extremely important. So why am I telling you that? Because the customer service piece I can sell the program however I, I can as a supervisor, but when it's truly working for my officers in the field, there's no better uh, marketing than that. They're going to call again. They're going to ha hit those intervention pieces when they are critically important. They're going to have those interruption points and they are going to change the trajectory, like Liz said, um, when we get to a place where maybe we're not at the crisis point. So um, the other critical piece, like I said, is the communication with the educational system has truly paid dividends, I think, for New Jersey law enforcement through the handle with care um, uh, component. Unaddressed childhood trauma is, um, in most cases, invisible for uh, a 911 responder. So when we do see those breadcrumb uh, cases where there's like, hey, um, I, I, we often get calls to a person's house. My kid won't get out of bed for school in the morning. Well, maybe that's an opportunity to see how the parent is doing. Maybe they're struggling and, you know, politely peel back the layers, delicately peel back the layers to see if there's a need for performed care or maybe a handle with care with notification might be present. And we didn't even know it. Uh, I can tell you that through CIT in Atlantic County, as well as the Atlantic City Police Department, the perform care phone number is something that we leverage at our roll calls. We leverage through a QR code for resources for our officers in the field. Um, so we can update that information. And it's not an inoculation just because we give this information out one time. We have to push that information and re-educate, um, re remind our police officers about the best practices with stabilizations at scenes and um, really leveraging the communication with performed care so we can prevent a tragedy and hopefully the support services can get there and we do not have to return to that house for repetitive calls for service, let alone an intervention where we're gonna actually traumatize the child or the family. So um, I'm happy to take any questions, but that's been my personal experience with performed care and the um, utilization of mobile response and stabilization services. Sergeant, look, there's a question there. Um, is there any fee to utilize performed care services? No, there, there's no fees to utilize performed care. In fact, that actually does come up a lot and it's very low barrier. Um, it is, like I said, shockingly, the response time is amazing. And um, I've even consulted back and forth with parents to, you know, it, I've had a, called performed care and I'll say, look, there's no obligation, there's no fees. And when you look at, I believe their their eligibility is five, I wanna say five years old is where they're at and they go up to 21, I think in most cases. So um, their their ability to service that, that, that's a pretty wide gap of age range to be able to service individuals. Um, in one case I have part, uh, there's this one case that I had, I say about five, years ago that stands out in my mind we had a critical incident at a house we stabilized the scene and shockingly uh, i didn't think that performed care was going to come out for the uh, remaining family members because somebody had to go to a hospital uh, to receive treatment but the performed care came to the scene in less than an hour uh, so when i tell you that some of the parents are like oh my god how am i going to pay for this what does this look like i have a job am i going to be able to get back to work Perform care even networked, like I said, with all of the other family members to bring in a support structure uh, for this one call for service. 
so that we could leave that scene and know that the family was going to have what they needed to be able to get by. And then a follow up to that, Sergeant, is there any cost to law enforcement agency? No, there's zero cost. In fact, uh, we sometimes will go back and forth with phone calls. They're very patient with us. Uh, they, we will sometimes have to call up and check their ETA um, just because we'll have change of shift and new sergeants will come on and say, hey, uh, you know, call up, find out what's going on. They will communicate with us repetitively, uh, effectively, and in a timely manner. Um, I can only tell, they will place us on hold once in a while and consult with a supervisor. Uh, but overall, I got to tell you, their, their program here in New Jersey is extremely law enforcement friendly. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Excellent. Do we want to go to the next slide then? And uh, wrapping that up, is there any other questions for our panelists today? You can either raise your hand or just put it in the Q&A box and we can get it to you. Well, while people are, are, are working on that, let me just uh, answer the, the finances question because that always comes up quite a bit. Uh, the, the services and supports are, are generally supported through Medicaid. Um, so children who have Medicaid, uh, they actually we would bill for that um, and, and the services get delivered there. But New Jersey built a carve out uh, for young people who didn't meet the criteria for Medicaid uh, to ensure that these services are delivered promptly to families because of the worry that they wouldn't use the services that they had to worry about co-pays and private insurance. States look at that in a couple different ways, um, but most states who are investing are trying to figure that piece out to ensure that it's a public health approach uh, to make sure that all children's needs are met. But I got, I, I, just to jump in on one thing, um, Elizabeth, you, you commented on the relationship with the schools and the educational system, because I, if there's one thing that I can say that I was um, impressed about, the, I didn't even realize it, but Perform Care will actually inquire the last, where do the kids go to school? Mm -hmm. They will, they, there's connectivity there where, you yeah. know, you, you they will, eat on phone calls, uh, you see a whole change in the scene when the parent begins to realize, like, this, there's, there's hope. Like, these questions, I've never, you know, I've been on a lot of critical calls where kids are present, and um, sometimes, obviously, the kids are, uh, you know, in crisis themselves, and we've utilized perform care. And I think it's important to underscore that they're not just supporting the uh, child in crisis or the kid, they're supporting the entire family. The entire household is getting the support. So I, I can't really think of a single drawback uh, from a law enforcement standpoint. And I really have to tell you that the shocking part for for law enforcement is when we're told uh, yeah, give them an appointment with a um, show up to this location or somebody will be out on this date and it's hours or whatever the situation mm -hmm. is. I, I, I can't begin to tell you how impressed I am and have thanks for Elizabeth, for her and her team, for what they did for, you know, mobile response in New Jersey, because I'm telling you, I've tried it. I've used it. I will continue to use it. I will continue to tell my officers and other officers in the county that, it is an effective tool for law enforcement because it's not services later, it's services now. It's when people need them and when the kids need this. And I just wanna close out on one thing that Liz said because it is so true. The first intervention is critical from a law enforcement standpoint. The increase, I, I wish I had the statistics or the empirical data for you, but if law enforcement goes back to that house over and over again, we are just increasing the likelihood for a critical incident or we're responding to one where a tragedy has taken place. The interruption points are there. We just have to teach our law enforcement through uh, active utilization of, of these mobile teams mm -hmm. to be able to recognize the opportunities to see those interruption points. And the last point that Liz made, and it's clearly true, we can change a trajectory. Because I'm, because I'm in the operations division, 
in law enforcement, you're either going to find those three things, the intervention, the interruption points, or the trajectory change as in the youth stage, or you're going to find it in the adult stage, and we're going to be revisiting it. So performed care has definitely delivered that. Mobile response is definitely something that's viable for law enforcement. And um, I don't know. Thank you very much for your time. Would you guys answer if per performed care state specific or not? I didn't answer it yet. I can answer it. So uh, yes, it is specific to New Jersey. It is just who New Jersey contracted with to be the single point of access, uh, that single phone number. So different states use different um, different ways of, of doing that. But if you're interested in your particular state and you want to ship me an email, I'd be happy to try and connect the dots for you in, in the work that's happening in your state. And then the next one, Elizabeth, is there evidence of the mobile response being Im implemented and working in the rural areas? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Oklahoma is just a really good example of rural and frontier uh, communities in which they've really been able to change the trajectory for young people touching in emergency departments, inpatient, and now residential. So it's pretty significant, yeah. And we can see it. It's being implemented in a couple other rural and frontier states as well. And then touching back on the requirements for your responders, is there any specific requirements as far as education levels? Yeah, generally it's a bachelor's degree in a related field. So certainly we want BSWs, you want uh, uh, young people and, and young people, that's such not a cool thing, but we want uh, folks who um, have some grounding in principles, but then there's a, a pretty robust uh, certification process that happens as well. And I think that's it for the questions. I think we have them all answered unless anything comes in quickly. Otherwise, can we go to the final slide there? And I think that's it. So with that, I'm going to end this. I'm gonna leave that information up there for anyone who wants. Um, the contact information for our panelists is also available there as well in the chats. This webinar was recorded. It'll be uploaded to our website within a week or two. Um, so you can check back then. And if you sign up for the newsletter there, you can also get access to it to there. So with nothing else, I'll let our panelists go and I appreciate everyone's time. Thank you, everyone.